Well, welcome back to this series of Current Culture. I really hope that you've been enjoying the lessons as we go through these hot topics. I have enjoyed studying and, and presenting this material and um, hopefully it continues to be a blessing for you as we uh, continue through uh, this study. This week we're talking about uh, gambling from God's perspective. Okay, gambling from God's perspective. What are your thoughts on gambling? Um, from the way maybe you were raised and you were brought up. For me, um, that it was a big, uh, we, we didn't gamble. <laughs> my, my parents were pretty strict on this. It was not allowed. Um, anything to do with gambling was not allowed. Playing cards were of the devil. Um, we, didn't, we didn't buy them. We didn't go near them. That's the way I was raised up. And if, if you think, um, if you think back a little bit, it, it used to be that people thought gambling was wrong. That, that was the general consensus. But now, gambling has exploded. It's exploded. In the 1900s, um, or since the 1990s, um, gambling has become extremely popular. Um, and even amongst Christians. That's, that's the part we want to talk about. Even Christians seem to be jumping on board with this trend of gambling. They even host things uh, like charity gambling events to raise money. Um, and this just, this, just, this just shouldn't be the case. Um, but it's, it just seems it's overwhelmingly a popular form of entertainment here in America. But it's got to raise some questions for us. Right, it's got to raise some questions like, well, why, why is it okay now, or why is this uh, so popular? Like, has our theology changed, or what's going on with our Christian consciences that uh, we think that gambling isn't a problem? Well, we're going to take a look at what the scriptures say about gambling because we need to have a biblical understanding of what the Bible says. What, what does the Bible say? What does God's Word say about this issue of gambling? Well, let's start off with a question. What trends in our culture have helped make gambling so acceptable? Well, the rise of postmodernism with its accompanying belief in evolution and the chance beginning of all that is alive, this has played a role in this. The gambling is a celebration of irrationality, the perfect postmodern game. It fits the morally relativistic culture in which we live. In a culture which believes that the world and life itself began by chance, in a culture embracing practical agnosticism, in a culture that looks upon the future with angst and pessimism, there's nothing to live for but me. There's nothing to live for but the here and the now. There's just uncertainty, with no means of rising above it, unless you get lucky. In this culture, the senselessness of gambling just makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about the history of gambling. Historically, American culture has had basically three different waves of gambling. The first was the colonial, throughout the 1800s. Lotteries were used uh, to help fund uh, new things like universities, hospitals, and even churches in the New England area. The second wave uh, was post-Civil War and through the 1900s. Uh, state lotteries were being used in the Deep South uh, to pay for war reparations. And there was also, you know, the old war or the, the old West saloons, uh, you know, that we see in movies, we're familiar with. We know what happens in those saloons. We had the gold rush towns and gambling became very popular during this time. Gambling during these periods um, began the run of greed and corruption. There was crime, suicide, prostitution, and many other social problems. Well, people realized this, um, and there was opposition to gambling at this time, and it, and it kind of shut it down for a while, um, but it never completely got rid of it. The third wave was in the mid to late 1900s. 
Um, there's several things that popped up during this time. Um, the legalization of gambling in Nevada in 1931. Um, there was the resurrection of state lotteries in the 1960s. And then there was also the passage of the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988. Whichever one really spurred this on, gambling by the 1990s became a national phenomenon. It had exploded. It had blown up. Um, there used to be only two places in the United States that you could go to gamble legally in a casino. It was Nevada and Atlantic City. Today, there are only two states you can go to that doesn't have legalized gambling. That's Hawaii and Utah. Hawaii has been able to stay gamble free because they're, they're trying to promote this island paradise and they're trying to hold off uh, the attempts of legalizing gambling in their area. Even bingo is illegal in Hawaii. You cannot play bingo. Um, Utah, that's really due to the Mormons. The Mormons have kept gambling um, out of their state. They don't want the influence of gambling to move in on them. In 2012, American gaming gross revenue reached $37.24 billion. That was the second highest ever. About 34% of Americans uh, say that they have visited a casino. 34% in 2012. And among the people under the age of 35, uh, the percentage went up to 39%. About 53% of Americans admit to playing the lottery. And a whopping 85% of Americans, including 60% of Christians, think that gambling is an acceptable form of entertainment. Now let's talk about perspectives on gambling. And the first point we're going to look at is two distracting focuses. Okay, when we talk about gambling, there are often two distracting uh, focuses uh, that come up during discussion. First is when we're talking about the numbers. Okay, when we talk about things like dollars and percentages. And the second one is talking about the devices. What are the device that's being used for the gambling, such as cards or dice. Well, first off, when we're talking about numbers, um, it doesn't give us a clear indication of the problem of gambling. Um, you, could, you could cite numbers on and on, but it doesn't tell you the true story. It doesn't tell you the good, the bad, the ugly uh, that comes from gambling. Um, I mean, you can look into and see how much money is lost uh, to certain people. Maybe you could dig into and see what kind of bankruptcy percentages are happening in a region near casinos. Okay, but it doesn't tell you the deeper thing, what, what's really happening. Okay, it doesn't tell you about the broken promises, the broken dreams, the broken hearts that are occurring because of gambling. The second thing is focusing on a device is just distracting. It doesn't really matter because they're not intrinsically evil. It's like the social media tool that we just discussed, right? That it's not intrinsically evil. So whatever you're using, whether it's cards or dice or cash or horses or greyhound dogs, um, it doesn't matter. They, they can be used as instruments of gambling, but they're no more evil than sports such as football or baseball or golf, which people use as well uh, for gambling. Neither of them, I mean, they're just, they're just tools that are being used or devices. There's nothing in and of themselves that makes them inherently wrong or evil. And we can't determine morality of gambling by looking at the devices that are being used. Secondly, I want to go over two misunderstandings uh, that are often the case. But gambling is not benign entertainment. Rather, it is immoral because we are using the resources that God has entrusted to us in an improper way. But with that being said, people are still asking the questions, is it right or wrong uh, to participate in gambling? Is gambling actually a sin or is it not? 
Or maybe is it a sin in cer certain circumstances and not in others? Or is gambling even just a, a form of entertainment that gets out of hand sometimes? Well, we can find the answers uh, to these questions. Um, but if you are a Christian, we have to open God's Word to see what it says. That is the, the only place um, that we are looking for um, how to answer these questions. We have to reference the Bible. Um, God gave us His Word so that uh, we can read it reasonably and apply it rationally. So our task as Christians is to apply God's moral will to the questions that we have um, coming to us uh, during our life, during um, questions that we encounter. Uh, we have to reference the Bible. The first misunderstanding is concerning lots. Well, casting lots involved different methods of making blind decisions so that no one could claim the decision was unfair or biased in any way. People often attempt to justify gambling by pointing back to the practice of casting lots. They say that casting lots is gambling, that God allowed it, and therefore that gambling is okay. The first reference we're going to look at is Joshua 18, 6 through 10. It says, You shall describe the land in seven divisions, and bring the description here to me. I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. For the Levites have no portion among you, because the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh also have received their inheritance eastward beyond the Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. Then the men arose and went, and Joshua commanded those who went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it and return to me. Then I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities and seven divisions in a book. And they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land to the sons of Israel according to their divisions. So it appears uh, that it was simply a matter of chance that no skills were involved in winning or losing. It is true that the Israelites used lots to determine divine will. Lots were used in the Old Testament to make decisions, to determine the assignment of land, to identify the man Jonah who caused the storm, and more. In the New Testament, lots were cast to distribute Christ's clothing and to choose Matthias to replace Judas. Let's actually read through Acts 1, 21 through 26. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they put forward two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles." Now, you might think, oh, Matthias kind of had a lucky day. The lot fell on him. He's very fortunate to get this position. But we have to understand that both Joseph and Matthias were um, great candidates for this position. Both of them were qualified. Um, they met what they were looking for. And either one of them could have been plugged into that spot to fill that 12th place of Judas um, since Judas was no longer there. So both of them were qualified, and it just so happened to be Matthias uh, that the lot fell on. With that being said, I think we need to look at Proverbs 16, verse 33. It says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So there is no luck in the casting of lots uh, according to the Bible. In the, in the biblical casting of lots, there's no such thing as luck. God was in control 
of the entire decision-making process. And they knew, too, they were submitting to God's sovereignty in all things. He is, he is in control. He is the one that um, uh, determines which way the lot falls out. But with that being said, let's uh, look at a few passages to determine and maybe see if uh, casting lots is still appropriate for us today, or maybe there's another means. First, we have John 16, verses 13 through 15. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. We also can look at Acts 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues like fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So we can see from these two references that it's no longer necessary to cast lots. The Holy Spirit has now come. It has empowered or it actually has inspired uh, the New Testament writers. And now we have the New Testament, which is our source of wisdom and guidance. So even though the casting of lots is mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament, I hope you have a better understanding of what it meant uh, to them to cast lots. And there's no way you can justify gambling because there was casting of lots during uh, biblical times. Uh, if you think about it, even the unbelievers, uh, like the soldiers who were casting lots for Jesus' garment, um, they weren't even gambling um, when they did that. Nobody was putting money into a pot. Um, nobody was putting anything at risk uh, for a hope of gain. Uh, they weren't winning something at someone else's expense. They were simply trying to determine who was going to get Jesus' robe. Um, there, I mean, just the casting of lots was... Um, a lot more similar to the drawing of straws than gambling is today. Um, casting lots, um, it, it wasn't putting anything at risk, hoping for a, lar a large outcome. That's, that's just not what it was. Casting lots was kind of re relying upon God's will um, in making decisions. Uh, they trusted in God's sovereignty. Gambling... Um, that places emphasis, uh, you know, you're, you're putting your, uh, the value on the risk that you're um, taking, hoping for a large outcome. Um, and you're depending on fate or luck or chance. Um, and that was not the case with the casting of lots. They were trusting in God. Uh, they, were, they were still making wise decisions like both Matthias and Joseph were qualified individuals, and they were trusting God uh, to determine the outcome. There was nothing random about it. Uh, there was nothing left to chance or to fate. So you cannot justify gambling because the Old Testament and the New Testament has references to casting lots. The second misunderstanding is concerning commandments. So while we find plenty of references to casting lots in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, and we know that that doesn't justify gambling, um, we also have to take into account that the Bible doesn't really say anything uh, directly against gambling. And we need to weigh in on that issue. Uh, it is important to do so. Um, you know, we need to take a moment to consider because we want to be careful not to invent to invent sins where there is no sin, uh, we, we want to be careful of legalism. So there is no 11th commandment that says thou shalt not gamble. 
There is no uh, black and white commandment in the scriptures um, that tell us this. Um, so it creates some tension as we're trying to figure out um, this issue of gambling that is just so popular in our culture today. And really that tension comes from um, as we're commanded as believers to live in the world but not be of the world. And this is one of those areas that can get kind of tricky for us as we try to determine how exactly we should be living in the world as a believer. We are commanded by God to make moral judgments um, and to live lives that leave room for other people to uh, live with the liberty um, that is allowed to us. And determining what a Christian liberty is and what is sinful can oftentimes uh, be difficult. But despite any kind of difficulties, um, God, God has charged us with being obedient to his moral will and to live righteously. It says in 1 Peter, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We should be striving for this holiness. God has given us his word in everything pertaining to life and godliness so that we are not lacking in an opportunity to please the Lord. Um, God's word is true. It's going to be true for all time. It's true for uh, every country, every kind of culture. It's always going to be relevant to us. Um, so we, we, we need to strive um, to please God, to glorify him in what we are doing. So as we're trying to figure out if gambling is something that we should be participating in, if it's something God would be pleased in, let's take a look at Philippians 1, 9 and 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in full knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and without fault until the day of Christ. So God's word is going to help us develop insight that we can use to discern things that are right, and it's going to help us live blamelessly before the Lord. Another verse I want to look at is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. This is such a, a profound verse for us that are believers, telling us what our goal and what our aim should be in this life. It says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We should be pursuing how we can live lives that are glorifying to him. So no, God didn't give us an 11th commandment that says thou shalt not gamble, but he's given us an entire Bible full of principles that we can use to determine how to live a good godly lifestyle. Um, we do this in other areas, for example, uh, slavery. Uh, slavery. Slavery is never directly um, addressed and prohibited in the Bible, but we know that it's a horrendous evil that we should not take part in. Um, we, are, we know this because we are commanded to love other people, and we are told that God is love. So therefore, we can come to the conclusion that slavery is wrong and it's and it's a sin and it's evil in the same way we can come to the conclusion that gambling is a sin even though it's becoming very popular and being legalized all over the place so let's talk about the morality of gambling there are at least five different teachings in scripture that gambling violates and together, these violations overwhelmingly indicate that gambling is a sin that believers should avoid in all of its forms. Honestly, there is no such thing as luck. Things do not just happen. Nothing happens outside of God's will. So if we have a belief in God, it gets rid of any idea of this notion of luck. And it also rejects any idea of chance. The idea that events happen by chance is just superstition. So take a look at this chart comparing sovereignty versus superstition. And we're going to go through some responses on both sides. It would be a good exercise if you pause the video now and think about what your response might be to each of these. What would your response to sovereignty be? And what would your response be uh, with superstition. But 
our response is, uh, if we uh, believe in the sovereignty of God, um, we should put our faith in God, not in chance. We should put, um, or we should have a trust uh, with God to love and care for us. And we should worship God no matter the circumstances. These are all results of um, God having sovereignty over all things. Now, with superstition, we're going to have responses such as we might try to manipulate the odds to be in our favor. Or we might rely on good luck charms to help us. Or thirdly, uh, we could see gambling as legitimate entertainment. So uh, look, look at these different responses that we have between a sovereignty, seeing God as sovereign, and believing in superstition. Pop culture tells us that all of life is a chance, but life is not a gamble. God is a control of life, down to the number of hairs on each of our heads. God expects us to worship him as the sovereign God over all things. Counting on luck and beating the odds is basically idolatry. Let's look at Matthew 4, verse 7. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Do you see why it would be wrong to acknowledge God's sovereignty and then ask him to make you a winner as you place your bet uh, for fantasy football or you are scratching off a lottery ticket? By doing so, you are testing God and trying to manipulate him to use his sovereignty to your own advantage. Now, of course, gambling believers are going to win once in a while. They are going to win their bet. They are going to maybe hit it big once in a while. Um, but that doesn't mean that God is approving of what they are doing. We find in Matthew chapter 5 that God reigns on the just and the unjust. And, well, the unjust still have to answer for their sins. The, the rain is not a sign of approval. The Christian who is able to win at a, at a poker game, um, he is still responsible to answer to God for his violation of his sovereignty. God's purpose for allowing the believer to win uh, may never be discovered, um, but we can be assured that he is displeased um, with the gambling that is in question. And as believers, God's discipline is the hand that we should be most concerned about. Secondly, we must look at unfaithful stewardship. Unfaithful stewardship. God is creator. He gives with an expectation of accountability. So we should live with an anticipation of responsibility. It is to God that we give account for every use of our time, our talent, and our treasure. The things we own are granted to us for a season. Whether they are toys or tools, we are responsible to God for their use. People say, it's my money, I can do with it what I want. But no, not really. God owns all things, but places them into our care for right uses to benefit us and to glorify Him. Look at Proverbs 12, 11. It says, He who cultivates his land will be satisfied with bread. But he who pursues empty things lacks a heart of wisdom. Can you see how gambling is like chasing a fantasy? Gambling promises piles of money and euphoric happiness. It most often leads to indebtedness and depression. Even those who win the lottery soon realize the inability of wealth to bring lasting joy. Well, when people gamble, they're partaking in something that is viewed as a form of entertainment. But unlike other forms of entertainment, maybe wholesome entertainment and recreation that is good for your well-being, physically, mentally, um, there's a lot of positives to it. Uh, gambling is very debilitating. Uh, it's very negative. It causes uh, loss of money. It causes um, it causes you to use a lot of time and resources and you can get stuck in the rot of gambling. 
And even if it's just some, you think it's some minor small gambling, a few dollars here or there for lottery tickets, that's still not being a good steward of what God has entrusted to you. The morality of it doesn't uh, matter the amount. It doesn't matter that, that it's a small amount that you're being uh, untrustworthy with, that you're not managing well, versus a large amount. Uh, there's nowhere in Scripture that allows for an exception such as that. No, we are called to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us, um, no matter the amount. And we shouldn't be trying to find little loopholes um, or areas that we can get away with um, not managing what he's entrusted us to correctly. The third violation of scripture that we're going to look at is theft. Yes, theft. Maybe you haven't thought of this before, but for one person to win at gambling, a lot of other people must lose. Call it robbery by mutual consent, but it is still taking from others that which you did not earn. Gambling also violates the biblical command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For you cannot love your neighbors while you are participating in something designed to take from them. Fourthly is covetousness. Gambling is fueled by the sin of covetousness. It's about greed, the desire to get something for nothing, something that belongs to someone else. If you doubt this concept, take the money out of the casino and see how many people continue to go there. Gambling is a classic example of Satan's use of worldly allurements, tempting people to sin. Something for nothing enchantments, or ornate casinos, graceful horses, exciting gaming tables, challenging slot machines, bright colored lights, and noise, but no clocks or windows. Gambling is a spiritual and financial time bomb in a pretty package. We read in Hebrews 13.5, Make sure that your way of life is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. But somebody that's involved in covetous gambling, it really reveals that he thinks God is incompetent and his presence is insufficient. Gambling feeds covetousness, which is the opposite of God's call for contentment. Gambling goes to the heart of human nature. No matter how much we have, we just always want more. Lastly, we are going to look at addiction. Gambling is potentially habitual, what Pascal called the fatal fascination. It's like a moth for the candle. Gambling is so potentially habitual that we've developed terms like obsessive, compulsive, and pathological to describe the problem. Yet God tells us we are not to allow our minds, bodies, or souls to be brought under the power of anything other than the Spirit of God. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven through 38 says, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Is it possible for a person to become addicted to gambling without violating this command? No, it's not possible. The addict's relationship with the addictive behavior or object is driven by his love. Some Christians are still going to argue, though, that gambling is only bad if it is abused. It's okay if you want to gamble casually or socially or just for fun. It's okay if you want to gamble as long as it's legal. What does it hurt if it's a few dollars here or there? Um, it's not going to destroy their character, right? Just this, this little side gambling that they do. Um, and they want to argue that it's a matter of Christian liberty. It's, 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 it's part of their Christian liberty. But I have to argue and say that the scriptures say otherwise. In addressing Christian liberty, the Apostle Paul wrote, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. He also said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So even if gambling were a matter of Christian liberty, which it is not, 
the facts that it is not beneficial and that it could be addictive would be reasons not to participate. We are not to partake of anything that would surrender the rational and reasonable control of our own actions. And some people will say that moral arguments uh, regarding gambling are dead. And when it comes to the public, that may be the case, but that shouldn't affect how we as Christians um, view this topic. It doesn't matter if it's dead to the public or not. We should still be building our Christian consciences with the Word of God. Uh, we should be able to consider biblical doctrines and what it says in regards to this topic of gambling and we do not need to endorse or participate in. Romans 14 5 says each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So we need to be good stewards and I really hope that this lesson has helped you to understand the biblical response to gambling. It is easy to criticize those involved in gambling and to point out how they are poor stewards of their wealth but maybe there's something um, in your life that you need to evaluate. Maybe you should uh, take a look at yourself. Have you been a poor steward of what God has entrusted to you? Our biblical response to current culture should be to practice love and stewardship instead of gambling. We need to practice love and stewardship instead of gambling. And our memory verse for this week is Ephesians 4.28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. I hope you learned a lot during this lesson. Uh, this topic of gambling is a hotly debated issue, especially amongst believers these days. Uh, Self-proclaimed Christians will argue back and forth whether gambling is allowed or not. But I think we have a firm uh, stance, a firm perspective from what the Word of God says on what our view of this should be. It is a sin. Uh, before I became a Christian, um, it was something that I partook in. Um, I played a lot of poker for cash, um, but through reading God's Word, um, I came to an understanding that it was wrong. Uh, it's, it's not glorifying God. It's not being the best steward of what He has given to me. It's, it's harming others and so forth through, through the list that, that, that I just previously covered. Um, so again, I hope you learned a lot. I hope um, maybe if you know someone that has a gambling problem or who's on the fence, whether this is um, technically a sin or not, or maybe you, they, they think it's part of Christian liberty, uh, you can share this video and maybe it will help them. Uh, next week's lesson is uh, pretty, it's, it's tied closely to this one. And we're going to look at God's provision for overcoming addiction. How God uh, helps us and provides us with victory over addictions in our life. Whether it's gambling or uh, drunkenness or any other kind of addiction uh, that we have. So stay tuned for next week. Um, have a great week.